Hello, today we are going to talk about um, weldability of metals. So, get this right out front, everything's weldable. Um, by weldable means, like, I can put a weld on it. The problem is, how long is that weld going to last? Um, I've done I've done repairs on stuff that lasted four hours because base metal wasn't base metal was pretty much not weldable. Um, sometimes you get lucky and it lasts longer than five minutes, but don't count on it. Um, so weldability. AWS definition of weldability is the capacity of a metal to be welded under the fabrication conditions imposed into a specific suitably designed structure and to perform satisfact satisfactorily in the intended service. So I can weld on anything. To AWS weldability means it's actually going to work and it's actually going to perform its intended service. That's the big difference. Okay. Um, any you can weld on anything doesn't mean it's weldable. So when it comes to materials and weldability, identification of what you're working on is key. When somebody brings me something to weld, my first question is well, what is it? Um, that part of the puzzle determines so much about what I'm going to need to do to it through cutting, grinding, or welding that I've got to have it. Misidentification of materials can have catastrophic consequences since a wrong filler or wrong heat treatment causes those welds to fail or the base metals to fail next to them. Um, a lot of times you don't have to wait. You'll see the weld cracking as you're, you know, as you're chipping the slag up of the welds cracking. Um, identification is key. Spark testing is a way to do that. Spark testing is hitting something with a grinder and seeing what the sparks look like. I'll link a video or two in this lesson to it. Spark testing, over time, you can learn a lot about it. You can tell, get a ballpark idea of carbon content, um, alloying elements. The big thing you can do is eliminate stuff right off the bat. I know exactly what cast iron looks like when I grind on it. So if something's cast iron, I can tell right away. Uh, if I think it's steel and it's cast iron, it's not going to work. Um, so when it comes to weldability of steel, carbon content is key. We talked about this a little bit in metallurgy, but it continues here. Um, carbon content is the like the biggest defining factor of weldability. More carbon, more carbon, less weldability. Um, the more carbon you've got, the less weldable something is. The alloying elements in a lot of steels play a big role too. If it's got um, chromium or molybdenum or um, manganese that plays a big role too and we can calculate that focus we can calculate that through what's called a carbon equivalency equation and we'll talk about that in another chapter but to tell you how important carbon content is that formula for carbon equivalency it takes all those alloying elements and relates them to carbon content and gives you a an approximation of what its carbon content is based on its alloying elements so carbon is key so um, having said that let's identify some materials so, the most common way of uh, for material identification is the A, the SAE slash AASI system, and that is a four digit um, four digit numbering system. Where let's say um, let's do forty one forty. The first digit is um, its alloying agent. The second digit is approximate percentage of that alloying agent. This, the last two digits, is going to be, or three if there's three digits, will be uh, carbon content. And it's going to be 0 0.40. So let's decode 4140. So 4140, the four means it is a molybdenum steel, it's a moly steel. One equals about one percent moly, and point four zero equals point four zero percent carbon. That's how we decode this. Um, if it starts with a one, so ten eighteen, the one is carbon. Uh, two is a nickel based steel. A three is a nickel chrome steel. Four is a moly steel, a five is a chromium steel, a six is a chrome vanadium steel, a seven is a tungsten steel, or a tungsten alloy, um, eights are nickel chromium vanadium, and uh, it starts with a nine, it's a silico manganese steel. 
Um, don't run into that a lot. The biggest ones we're going to run to is in, run into are um, anything that starts with a one, anything that starts with a four, so it starts with a five. The rest of it's real and common for us welders. Real common in the tool industry, not common for welders. So um, there's a billion different alloys. Uh, there's some great resources online. Look them up. Um, they're trying to make a unified numbering system for like the world. I don't know if that's ever going to happen. What is low carbon? What do we define low carbon as? So low carbon is because we throw all these terms around: low carbon, medium carbon, high, high carbon. Low carbon equals zero percent to point um, oh three percent max. Low carbon steel super weldable. Um, Pretty much everything we weld is low carbon steel. Yeah, it's structural shape, plate, all that kind of stuff. Medium carbon equals um, 0.03 percent, or pardon me, not 0 0.03, 0.30, 0.30 percent to 0.50 percent carbon max. So medium carbon steels, so 4140 falls into that range. When we talk about carbon equivalent steel, we'll actually do 4140 and we'll see that it actually falls a little above that with its, with all of its alloying elements. But medium carbon steels, they are fairly weldable, um, but they take some care. You're gonna be you're gonna be preheating and postheating this stuff, or you're gonna have problems. Anything Anything in this range is weldable, but we got to be real careful with it. We got to make sure we got the right filler. We got to make sure we we understand what we're doing. We've got our heat heat right, all that kind of stuff. High carbon is um, 0 0.50 percent to um, one percent. I'll tell you right now, this stuff is weldable. You're it's a coin flip every time you weld it. Uh, there's just too much to go wrong with it. Uh, you can weld it. It takes some really, some really special considerations when you do that. There's one other. Um, it's just got too much carbon. There's one other um, group, and that's tool steels. Um, it's 0.80 percent. To like 1.5 percent is not like I would consider it not weldable. It's just you can. It's it's it takes a lot of work. You got to anneal the parts before you weld them. You get everything right. You got a butter material on before you weld it. It's it's a mess. Not weldable. So um, what we have to remember so important. I'm going to write it down. As carbon content goes up, preheat goes up. As carbon content rises, so does pre and post heat requirements. Okay? My, as, as carbon goes up, my need for pre and post heat goes up accordingly. Um, let's talk about some specific steels. Um, and why do we pre and post, post heat? That's right, to control the cooling rate. Um, so the book talks about high manganese steel. High manganese steel is used a lot in heavy industry. Um, it actually gets... Um, it gets harder the more it's impacted. It actually forms martensite, which is um, the hardest of the crystalline structures. It actually forms martensite as it gets impacted. It's not very weldable, but you see it a lot. It's very wear resistant. Um, pain in the ass to deal with. Low alloy, high strength steels. Lots of use in the industry now. As they try to get weight down on everything for fuel efficiency, they're going to stronger steels and they're using less of it. Some are very, very weldable, some aren't, so you have to do some research. Um, stainlesses, there's three main types of stainless. There's austenitic, ferritic, and martensitic. Um, austenitic is the stuff we weld on. Ferritic and martensitic are not. Um, 
Austin Etiquette 304, 316, the, the common ones we use all the time. Um, let's see. Primali steel, like 4140, 4130. Um, use for high temperature service and for aircraft parts, everything from roll cages to gun barrels. They make out of 4140. It's great stuff. It is weldable, but it's tricky. Um, cast iron, I hate cast iron. Um, cast iron actually has uh, between like 1 to 4% carbon, which makes it really hard to weld. You've got to do a lot of preheat. Um, and it's, a, it's always a repair job. Nobody builds new stuff out of cast iron. It's always a repair. So a lot of times we use a high nickel rod. Nickel gives ductility to the weld. Um, I hate cast iron. It's a crap sheet every time I fix it. Um, let's see. Aluminum. So there's about a, about a million aluminum alloys out there. Most of them are very weldable. Some of them aren't. You have to do some research. Weldable. Some of them aren't. You have to do some research on them. Um, the thing you have to remember about aluminum is that aluminum's got an oxide layer on it that melts at um, 1300 degrees. So you've got your your piece of aluminum. Probably the oxide layer melts at 3500 degrees. Just being exposed to the air, aluminum has an oxide layer on it. Okay, the aluminum's melting point is about 1300 degrees. The melting point of this is like 3500 degrees. So what happens is you go to weld aluminum without cleaning it and it'll have a skin on it like pudding and you can't get through it. That's why we use AC. Um, the AC with the electrons going that way and the electrons going that way, this is the DCEN phase and this is the DCEP. Um, that DCEP side of it actually lifts the scale off as we weld so we still got to brush it and clean it but that's why we use AC for aluminum because we need that DC electropositive side of that sine wave to lift the scale off. The easy thing about aluminum is there's like two fillers that work for 90% of the aluminum you'll ever run into. And that's uh, 4043 and I always get this from 5356. Those are the two fillers that work for pretty much all of the aluminum. Um, have both of it on hand and you'll be able to do pretty much anything. So to wrap this up, um, cover a lot of material in this. The filler metal manufacturers are the best resource you will have. Um, you won't believe this, but you're like three phone calls away or three transfers away from a welding engineer at any time. If you call Hobart or Lincoln, and explain to them your problems. I'm trying to weld this, my weld keeps cracking. In three transfers, you'll be, you'll be talking to their welding engineer. And they actually want to talk to you. They're really cool people. Um, don't hesitate to call the filler metal manufacturers for help. That's what they're there for. Um, they've, got, they've got the resources to do it. They will help you. The other thing is your local salespeople are really good contacts too. They know a lot about fillers. Um, but they also have a lot of exposure to what's going on in industry and they might be able to give you pointers or say, hey, call this guy, they're doing something similar, they might be able to help you. Um, but this, read the chapter. There's a ton more stuff in this chapter than I covered in this lesson. Um, read the chapter. Summary, all metals are weldable. The only limitation is the fabrication and repair of parts. Um, repair work is really cool. It gives you a real diverse kind of job. You can do all kinds of different stuff. Um, cast iron sucks. That's the moral of the story. Um, got any questions, find me online, find me in the lab. And I'll talk to you later.